Hello, you are listening to Maghrib in Past and Present Podcasts, a space dedicated to history, art, culture, politics, sociology, anthropology, and many other subjects. This episode is part of the history of the Maghreb History in the Maghreb series and was recorded on July 19, 2019 at the Centre d'études Maghrebina Tunis CEMAT. In this episode, Dr. Larissa Chomniak, CEMAT Director, interviews Paul Love, Assistant Professor of North African, Middle Eastern and Islamic History at Al Akhawain University in Morocco, about his research entitled The Buffalo Agency, Maghrebi Ibadis in Cairo, 1850-1950. Your dissertation, first book, and current projects are about Ibadi networks in North Africa. Who are the Ibadis? Right, so this is one of the scariest questions um, that all of us who work on Ibadis have to answer because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of responsibility in answering this question because it's not a question that gets asked in English very much. And um, there are very few members of the Ibadi community worldwide who can answer the question or have the platform to be able to do it, that we do. So the the quickest way to answer the question is that Ibadis are neither Sunni nor Shi'i Muslims. So that makes them immediately different than what most people think of in terms of what Islam means. From their perspective, they are the oldest identifiable community in Islamic history, in the sense that they feel like they have an identity from the first century of Islam that distinguishes them from their contemporaries. Of course, they wouldn't refer to themselves, at least in the earliest period, as Ibadis. They'd simply be Muslims, just like everybody else did. Um, But what they end up developing really early on is their own corpora of texts. So they have their own hadith collection, and they have their own uh, madhab of fiqh, of jurisprudence. They have their own historical tradition and hagiographical tradition. Um, They have their own theological tradition that makes them quite different from other Muslims. And so they really do represent this very very distinct third form uh, of Islamic history and Islamic intellectual history in particular. Now, that's sort of the early stuff. Um, and when the community gets started, it, like so many other early Muslim communities, starts in the city of Basra, uh, in what is today Iraq. And Basra was this place um, where a lot of ideas were circulating in the first century or so of Islamic history. And about these overlap in a lot of ways with a lot of other early communities. But some of the things that come to distinguish them pretty early on are particular theological perspectives and uh, their own perspective on who it is that ultimately should be the leader of the Muslim community. Now, I don't want to take this too far um, because I think that it's a bit dangerous to simplify it this way. But if you want to think about the sort of standard way that Sunnis and Shi'is are um, described and distinguished from one another in terms of political thought, the idea that in Sunni Islam, there should be someone from the family of the Prophet Muhammad and more broadly from the tribe of Quraysh that leads the community. There's this sort of standard uh, line of leaders in early Islamic history who are identified as Sunni caliphs. And that's always contrasted, right, with different versions uh, of uh, the sort of broad category of Shia Islam, where you have imams. So Ibadis also have imams, but... Unlike Shi'ism, where there are particular um, genealogical characteristics that those people need to have to lead, the basic idea in Ibadi political thought, and this is also religious thought, is that the person who leads the community should simply be the most pious and upright person. Now, not surprisingly for early Islamic history or for early medieval world history, that person needs to be a man and typically almost exclusively uh, from a free background. Uh, In theory, that could be absolutely anybody, which makes them very different from from other communities. In practice, it didn't always work out that way, but that was the basic idea. And then geographically, pretty early on, Ibadism develops in two very, very different directions. So it doesn't stay in Basra for very long. 
Um, instead, it splits into two different geographic regions, one in the Arabian Peninsula in what is today the Sultanate of Oman and parts of Yemen, and then the other here in northern Africa in these sort of different um, islands, what's often referred to as the Ibadi Archipelago that connects places like northwestern Libya, the Jebel Nafusa in northwestern Libya, the island of Jirba here in Tunisia, and the Mzab Valley in uh, what's today central Algeria. So pretty early on, those two break apart. And although there is some interaction between the two, they develop very, very different ideas of what it means to be Ibadi. Uh, and then much later in history, when they come back to one another, in particular in places like Cairo, which is my most recent interest in the early modern period, they begin to rebuild a shared history that overlooks a lot of those differences. Your current project, The Buffalo Agency, is about the history of Ibadi Muslim communities in Ottoman Cairo. Can you tell us more about your new work? Yes, yeah, so one of the other things that ends up happening after that sort of for, post-formative period of Ibadi history, when the two different communities sort of split off into these different geographies, is that Ibadis end up in Cairo, and they're probably there from the medieval period forward, but they're definitely there from the 17th century forward. And the reason that I know that, and I kept coming back to Cairo even though I didn't mean to uh, in previous work, was because my book project was about these five books. And this corpus of five books, I was looking for all of the different manuscript copies of these five books. And when you go to the end of an Arabic manuscript, you often find uh, in the colophon, in the sort of closing lines of the manuscript, the place where it was copied and by whom and when. And one of the things that I kept noticing in, and I maybe looked at 150 different copies, 125 or 150 different copies of these manuscripts. And over and over and over again, this place called the Wikedet al-Jamus, was the site of transcription for all of these different manuscripts. And so I was primarily interested in what's happening in the Maghreb, but what I ended up discovering through other people's work was that the Wikedet to Jamus, uh, what I've translated as the Buffalo Agency, perhaps I should translate it as the Water Buffalo Agency, since that's a bit more accurate. But um, that this place was... Uh, really important to early modern Ibadi history. And so I had to deal with it. At the very end of the book, I deal with it very, very briefly. Um, but I was just super interested in what was going on there and what this place was. And so that's how I got started with this new project. And so as I started working on the history of this agency, I found out that lots of the really important folks in early modern Ibadi and modern Ibadi history were connected to this place. It was a place that a lot of people passed through and it sort of lent itself to being uh, a bigger project. And so I got started with it that way. So the Buffalo Agency may have had a predecessor that was older than the 17th century, but it exists because of the establishment of a waqf, of a pious endowment at the beginning of the 17th century. What it seems like probably happened was a pretty wealthy Ibadi merchant from a family uh, in Jirba uh, called the Bahar family um, was in Cairo and decided to donate a lot of money to purchasing this structure, which was what we'd probably in Tunis refer to as a funduk, like an open uh, courtyard surrounded by several stories uh, of rooms. And so he purchases this thing in the Tulun district of Cairo and endows it for the benefit of North African Ibadi students who are coming to Cairo. So that's sort of how it seems to have gotten started. And then in the 17th century, there are a bunch of important folks connected to Ibadi history that pass through there. Um, and that's how I sort of get started with the project. So I mentioned that it's in this area of Cairo called Tulun, which is around the Ibn Tulun Mosque which for a really long time is where if you're North African and you come to Egypt, whether you're coming for commercial activity, to be a student, to be a teacher, or even on your way through to do pilgrimage to Mecca, you come through this area of town and you stop there and you probably have relatives there or you have friends there or some sorts of connections. So it's this really tightly knit North African community. And one of the biggest communities there from the 17th century forward is the German community. And so Ibadis being part of the German community 
uh, set sort of set up shop there centered on the Buffalo Agency and the buildings around it. So the project gets started by looking in particular at the 17th century and the relationship between the Buffalo Agency, the people moving through it, and the legal system in Cairo. And that's because one of the things that the Ottomans do when they get to Cairo in the 16th century is they start setting up a more formalized legal system of courts. So in the pre-modern period, not just in Cairo, but elsewhere, normally a court was probably at a Qadi's house, right? In the case of the Ottomans in Cairo, what they end up doing is setting up courts in actual places. And so the one that's in the Tulun district is in the center of the that area of town in the Ibn Tulun mosque, right? So I was interested, do Ibadis use that system? Because that by itself was really interesting. They're not uh, Hanafis, like the Ottomans, right? They're definitely not Hanbalis or Shafi'is or Malikis. So do they use this legal system? And yes, of course they do, is, is the, the brief answer to that. So I started looking at every case that I could find in which Ibadis show up in the courtroom uh, in the 17th century. And uh, it turns out that they, like all of their contemporaries, use the legal system in really interesting ways for their benefit. They endow property, they endow palm trees, they endow books. Um, they run their probate cases out of the court system. In some cases, they work on inheritance using documents, whether oral or written, from courts in Jerba that they then bring with them to Cairo and then show to the, the judge uh, in Cairo. So I was interested in that, and that part of the book focuses on a particular individual uh, from a family in Jerba, the Abu Sitta family. And this guy, uh, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Abi Sitta, is a really important dude in Ibadi intellectual history as somebody who writes a lot of commentaries and stuff like that. But it turns out that he's also in the courtroom a lot. And it's because he helped um, litigate cases, uh, in particular a probate case of a member of uh, um, of a German family, the Nafusi family. And so I follow this series of cases where he's sort of um, helping uh, deal with the inheritance cases of this family. And what I like about that, what I like about looking at this through the lens of law is this is a way that people are not accustomed to thinking about Ibadis. Thinking of them primarily as a religious community is to the exclusion of the fact that this guy, Abu Sitta, just like everyone else, had a life outside of his religious life, and he had uh, a family, and they show up in the court records. I learned the name of his wife and of his son through this. Uh, they have a house. You know, He has students that he's also friends with. And so I use uh, law as a way to think about everyday life. And then moving forward in time, um, in the 18th century, I use the Buffalo Agency as a way to think about uh, the way that merchants and scholars interact with one another in Ottoman Cairo. So this guy, Abu Sitta, in the 17th century was probably the first librarian. So that's his connection. In this, the 18th century, the focus of the project is on the library itself. So how does the library become the library? It does so in two different ways. Either really rich merchants, of which there were many in 18th century Cairo from the Abadi German community, donate books and they have all of this extra money to donate books or make other endowments for students there because they're involved primarily in the coffee trade which is big business in, in 18th century cairo and so they're involved with the coffee trade and they donate a lot of books to the library and they also for cases in which the books wouldn't be available namely for non maliki or hanafi or shafi books uh, they commission students to copy them so merchants are sort of at the center of the production of books and the accumulation of books at the library. And this is something that more broadly is happening all over the place in 18th century Cairo, outside of Ibadi communities. So just as was the case with the legal system, that Ibadis are interacting with it the same way that everybody else is, so too the, the culture of books and intellectual activity in the 18th century happens the same way as it does for non-Ibadis. Now, the reason that they want all these books is not to study at this very small school uh, in some out-of-the-way corner of Cairo. It's because students come there from Jerba and elsewhere to study at Al-Azhar University. So if you look at the contents of this library, they're the same sort of corpora of text or the curriculum that you'd be studying at Al-Azhar University. But because there are also 
a lot of students, a lot of teachers, and a lot of Ibadi books, one of the other things that ends up happening at the agency, in addition to commercial activity and this library, is a kind of informal school forms around it. And so, especially from the 18th century forward, it seems to have functioned as its own kind of madrasa for Ibadis in Cairo. Sort of, you study at Al Ashar several days of the week, and then you also study at the agency for other days of the week. And the way that I know all of that stuff is through the manuscripts themselves. So the same thing that brought me to the project in the first place, those colophons at the end of these manuscripts also say things like this was copied for so-and-so at the agency in so-and-so year, or I copied this at Al-Azhar University for the benefit of students at the agency. Uh, you also have in the margins all of these different notes about this book was donated by so-and-so for the benefit of students. So through all of these different marginal notes, you can reconstruct this really fun history in the 18th century of how people use books. And then by the end of the 18th century, in particular with the, uh, the arrival of the French in Cairo for a very brief period of time, and then subsequently the rise of Mehmed Ali uh, and a new, very different relationship with the Ottoman Empire, Ibadis become more connected in new ways to what's happening around them in the political world. So there are a few different things that happen over that period of time, and Azhar is not really, um, it's not as strong and as prominent as it used to be. Well, it's certainly as prominent as it has been for a while, but um, there are a lot of people who write in the early 19th century about the decline of Al-Azhar in, um, in terms of the quality of education, its organization, its overpopulation, stuff like that. So Ibadis are still coming to Cairo to do that kind of stuff. Um, but one of the things that I become interested in in the 19th century is how they're also interacting in different ways um, with the political community. And I do so by focusing on a particular character, uh, Saeed al-Shemekhi, who is the wakil for the Bay of Tunis in Egypt. But before he's the wakil for the Bay of Tunis, he's also the director and the teacher of the Buffalo Agency. So in each different part of the book, in other words, I'm trying to connect this particular place to a much broader story. And in the case of Saeed Shemehi, he is not only a scholar, his family is also uh, connected to the merchant community. Uh, he represents, before he becomes the wakil, he represents merchants, um, Tunisian merchants more broadly, not just the Ibadis, in Ottoman Cairo. Um, and so I'm interested in his career as both uh, an intellectual figure and as a political figure and thinking about how Ibadis fit into a, a bigger um, 19th century conversation of Ottoman history. And then sort of last stage is one of his contemporaries who shows up in several documents with him is this guy Muhammad al-Baruni, who starts like so many other Ibadis do by coming from Northern Africa or from North Africa to Cairo to study at al-Azhar. He becomes an Azhari, but then in the 1880s sets up a printing house. And this is just like every other stage of the project prior to this, this is something that everybody is doing in the 1870s and 1880s in Cairo. And so it's not a surprise that he decides to do this. He sets up a printing house uh, called the Baronia Press, Le Matba' al Baronia. And for the first time, you have lithograph copies of Ibadi books. And the connection here is not only that Muhammad al Baroni lived at the Buffalo Agency and set up the printing press close by in the Tulun district, um, but also because he donates a lot of books to the libraries. The, the library continues to grow in the late 19th century through donations by merchants and by printers uh, of lithograph books. And one of the other cool things about this is that this also leads to the broadening of connections um, among Ibadi communities in different parts of the world. So one of the things that print technology and steam power moving people around and books around a lot quicker is that suddenly Northern African Ibadis, Omani Ibadis, and also through the Omani connection in East Africa, Zanzibari Omanis become much more aware of each other and have a lot more uh, regular interaction than they ever had before. And print technology is really what allows that to happen. But in addition to Ibadis talking to one another, they're also talking to non-Ibadis a lot more for the first time in terms of the exchange of ideas. And so their books show up in people's libraries in a way that they wouldn't have in manuscript form because they're cheaper 
um, but also because you can move them around a lot easier. And so that leads into the very last uh, kind of epilogue part of the project, because this is something that some colleagues of mine have done uh, a much better job on than I would, which is at the very end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, with um, Islamic reform movements, um, what's broadly referred to as Salafi movements, and uh, also anti-colonial movements. Print technology is something that plays an important part in how Ibadis interact with all of those conversations at the beginning of the 20th century. Those are the parts of the project that I haven't quite figured out what I'm going to do with yet, but that's the sort of broad arc of the project. The idea is to constantly take Ibadis and situate them in something much bigger. Why are you um, currently in Tunisia for this research? Right, so I mentioned that one of the parts of the project that's still sort of coming together is the relationship between Ibadi community communities in Cairo and the political sphere of the Ottoman world. And that particular figure of uh, Saeed al-Shemehi, the wakil for the Bay of Tunis, it turns out I had read several times that uh, his correspondence was here in Tunis at the National Archives, but I'd never seen an actual reference to it. So I came here to see if it actually exists, and it does. It's by far the most numerous uh, in terms of the number of letters um, of the uh, of the archival documents of the wakils of of Tunis in Cairo, it's maybe about four hundred uh, letters, and so I have basically been here photographing and trying to read as many of those as I can, and also to look at um, to look at other traces of ibadis in Cairo through whether diplomatic relationships or tribunal records or just sort of random colonial traces from the late nineteenth century that the French may have. Um, have have ended up recording in the archive by accident. So, for example, the French become legally responsible for all of the Tunisians who are studying at Al-Azhar, right? When they take over, they suddenly become responsible for all of these people. And so there are some of those people who are also Germans and a very small number of them who are also Ibadis. So I'm looking for sort of any little trace of that kind of stuff in the archive. How does this research connect to the major themes in primarily early modern and modern North African histories? So if I'm completely honest with, with anyone that I talked to about this project, I was absolutely terrified of doing this project because I didn't want to work on Egypt because there's a gigantic historiography of Egypt that I was really intimidated by. And I didn't want to work on the Ottomans because if there's anything bigger than Egyptian historiography, it's Ottoman historiography. So there's these really, really big conversations that are happening, and I'm interested in contributing to those, at least in some way. But more precisely, what the project is doing is thinking about Ibadis in precisely the opposite way that I started my academic career thinking about them. So I was interested in the construction of communal boundaries. So the first book that I did was about how do Ibadis become Ibadis in North Africa, and the argument there is pretty simply that they create these bodies of literature that include and exclude certain people. They allow you to sort of build up the walls and maintain them over a long period of time. What I came to the conclusion of by the end of that project, though, was especially in the early modern period, it's precisely the opposite that ends up happening. So what I'm interested in doing in this project is saying, look, here are Ibadis not as a diaspora community, right, in Ottoman Cairo, but as Ottomans. So they live in Ottoman Cairo just like everybody else does. And beyond that, they're very, very prominent actors in the commercial scene and the intellectual scene and the political scene of Ottoman Egypt in a way that counters the um, isolated, um, insular way of thinking about Ibadi history prior to that. So... In other words, what I'm interested in doing is showing people that Ibadis are very much part of the world of the Ottoman Empire in the same way that their contemporaries were. And what that ends up meaning is that I'm interested in contributing to broader conversations about North Africans in the Ottoman Empire, which there's a, a really wonderful body of literature, primarily in French and Arabic, about that. So I'm interested in contributing to that by taking the arguments of other people um, 
uh, about North Africans in the Ottoman Empire and situating Ibadis into that. I'm also interested in using the particular communities of Ibadis and their relationships between Egypt and um, and Istanbul as a way of thinking about center and periphery, which is a very, very big discussion in Ottoman history and has been for a very long time. The period that I'm interested in and really focus on in the 18th century was for a very long time in Ottoman historiography thought as a decline period. And so I'm interested in thinking about how my project fits into that. But again, I'm really intimidated by those things because they're not, you know, they're not something I was trained in. So I'm coming into this uh, as an outsider, and my hope is that ultimately, as a result of that, I will be able to offer something new to the conversation. Thank you for listening to Maghreb in Past and Present Podcasts. Other episodes are available on our website, www.themagrebpodcast.com, as well as on iTunes and Podbean. For more information on our podcasts, like our Facebook page, Maghreb in Past and Present Podcasts, subscribe to the Semat newsletter at www.sematmaghreb.org, or visit the webpage of the American Institute for Maghreb Studies. See you soon for a new episode.